others. Hello everybody and welcome to this very special webinar, What the Internet is Teaching Your Child About Sex. My name is Jessica and I'm from Family Zone and I'm so lucky to be hosting this webinar tonight with cyber experts and all around great people, Dave and Katie Kobler from Your Choices. Uh, Dave and Katie are a husband and wife couple who speak around Australia and New Zealand, specialising around the topics of sexuality and relationships. They've spoken to over 250,000 teens and parents and teachers in live audiences and have a mission to turn taboo subjects into everyday conversations. Now, Dave has a Bachelor in Theology, theology and Katie has an Advanced Diploma in Psychological Science. They've been featured in both print, radio and TV media and highly sought after commentators. Uh, their hope is to create an environment where parents feel empowered to talk to their children and their kids feel um, confident to talk to their parents about topics that really matter. So welcome, Dave and Katie. Thank you so much for joining me. There they are. Hi, guys. How are you tonight? Good. Thank yeah, you. Really Thanks good. for Thanks. having us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. We're in WA, um, but I know you guys are over east, so it's getting quite late for you. So I appreciate you um, staying up late um, and accommodating us West Coast uh, peeps over here. Thank you very much. Pleasure. So before I hand over to you guys, um, I might just do a few housekeepings um, and um, just go through this agenda. Um, so the first thing I will say is that this webinar is being recorded um, and we will make that available for you um, in the next few days. We'll email that out, including all the links that we um, might reference tonight. Um, so don't think that you need to madly take notes or, you know, memorise what, what we're trying to say. We will make it available for you afterwards so you can watch it all again if you want to. Um, now, a, a few things about Zoom before we get started. Now, I think a lot of us are getting really familiar um, with Zoom after being in, you know, different stages of lockdown with, um, with COVID. Uh, but... Zoom uh, webinar, which is what we're in now, is a little bit different to Zoom meeting. So with a webinar, you should be able to see and hear me, but we cannot see you or hear you and nor can anybody else that's in attendance um, of the webinar. So, you know, just kick back and relax. If you're in your PJs and Ugg boots, just relax. Nobody is judging your um, pajamas and Uggies, yeah? So um, just relax and enjoy the webinar. Um, now, in terms of the questions, we're super lucky tonight. Uh, we've got some Family Zone support staff joining us. So if you do have any Family Zone related questions, um, you can type them at any point. Um, just have a look at your Zoom toolbar. You should see that there's a few different buttons. Uh, the, about the fourth one along it says Q&A. Now you can type your questions in there. You can even type them anonymously if you want to and our Family Zone support staff will um, answer those for you. Now they will um, put the more common ones um, in, in the public thread, so have a read of that. Um, but um, anything that's um, unique or might need following up later on, they'll follow up with you. Now, if you have some questions for Dave and Katie, hopefully um, we'll have time for a couple of those at the end of the session. Um, and we'll get to those after Katie and Dave um, have spoken and I've gone through a little bit of Family Zone stuff as well. Now, the last thing with the Zoom housekeepings, um, on the photo of me talking, there should be some little um, lines in the left-hand corner. If you click on those, you can drag it and make it bigger, um, just so it makes it a little bit easier for viewing. Yeah, so that is about all the housekeepings. You can see from the agenda, I'm gonna hand over to Dave and Katie in a second and they're gonna run through what is the internet teaching our child about sex. 
a fantastic um, presentation that all of us parents need to get our heads around. And then I will do a little bit of Family Zone stuff and show you how Family Zone can assist with some of the things that Dave and Katie are going to talk about. Um, and then lastly, we will go through what's next and where to get some help if you need it. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you guys, Dave and Katie, and um, let you take it from here and I will mute myself and I will be back when you guys have finished. Thanks so much, Dave and Katie. Great, thanks Jess. And thanks to your support uh, stuff as well. Uh, this is our third webinar tonight. So thanks guys for answering all the questions and welcome to all of you as parents. Uh, as Jess said, we've been working in schools uh, for many years and have over time uh, just become more and more passionate about helping children and young people in this space as parents ourselves, uh, we have three uh, fairly young children, uh, three-year-old, six-year-old, and a nine. Oh, hang on, that's not right. Three, seven, four, four, seven, seven and nine. And, nine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we recognise just how hard it can be to navigate these topics with your kids. Uh, we are really passionate about opening the conversations, but what we really love about our partnership with Family Zone is that as we, our role in this partnership, we see encouraging parents to have these conversations uh, with kids about this stuff. Family Zone really just bring the practical elements to putting the structures in place to help young people have positive experiences in this online space. We're gonna put a poll up right now. Uh, just, oh, do you wanna explain? Yeah, we just, we're <laughs> gonna do a couple of polls tonight. We wanna make it a bit interactive and see what your thoughts are. So this, this poll is simply, asking who do you think is having the greatest influence on young people's or a young person's decision around sex? Who are they considering with the information they've got or the people they've talked to? Uh, what's kind of helping them make that decision? And while you're answering that poll, um, I want you to kind of think back to your childhood and maybe what your first conversation uh, was around the topic of sex. Uh, was it helpful? Was the information you got correct? Uh, was it uh, from someone who you trusted? Uh, was it appropriate? Uh, was it uh, an experience that you have positive or fond memories of? Was it something that you had more negative emotions? If you could think about the experience that you had and then think, would you want that same experience for your child or would you want it to be uh, something quite different? Uh, you know, whatever your response to that is, uh, you know, when we think about who's talking to young people about sex, and it's interesting that, that the, um, if I put the results of these polls up uh, now, uh, we see that obviously friends is where a lot of young people will get a lot of information. Uh, the second one seemed to be uh, media and the internet giving a lot of information mm. uh, around uh, sex. Uh, and um, when it came to parents, that was third, which is uh, pretty great. And this study actually that looked at this question where are young people uh, kind of turning to or getting uh, their information or considering what choice they would make around sex? What do they have in their mind of who, what they've heard and what they've thought? And what they found is actually that uh, of 12 to 14 year olds, they said parents were the ones that had the biggest influence on what their decision of sex would be. Uh, when it was uh, 15 to 19 year olds, again, still 38% were saying parents had the biggest influence. And finally, uh, even as adults, 43% uh, of this very large US study uh, found 43% of adults would say parents influence their decision around sex most. And I see this uh, as a two-sided coin. One is it's really encouraging because if parents are having a uh, conversation with their kids about uh, these topics, then uh, their kids are going to be able to potentially grow up and make informed, positive, healthy choices around it. But the other side of the coin is the concern of, well, what happens if parents are avoiding these conversations? What happens if parents feel like they can't have these conversations or it's too awkward to have these conversations? You know, there can be a challenge for young people to then fall back onto some of those other places that you uh, wrote down. Yeah, one of the things that, uh, one of the shifts I suppose that we've noticed uh, in our work with young people 
is, you know, nine, 10 years ago, when we first started running programs in schools, we would very often after a seminar, have emails from parents and they'd say, thanks for chatting to my kids about, about this stuff, really appreciate it. Uh, we've just got a question, how do we talk to our kids about this stuff? How do we continue that conversation on? Uh, what are some tips and tricks uh, around that? And, you know, the greatest surprise has been, I suppose, that uh, as the years have gone on, uh, actually, for me, the biggest question, the most common question that I receive from young people is this, Katie, how do I have this conversation with my parents? I want that person who will sit beside me. I want that support person. I want that shoulder to cry when things don't go well. I want somewhere I can ask my questions. And, you know, we find that young people are desperate <laughs> to have these conversations more and more as the years go on. And so it's so important for us as parents to be equipped uh, to really just, you know, how do we do that? Mm. How do we engage with our children around these topics? So I'm excited that you're all here tonight. It's, um, and we're, we really hope that we've got some great and helpful tools for you. Definitely. We want to look at this thought uh, that if you don't teach them, someone else will. And uh, yeah, this is an important thing to consider around this, mm. right? Yeah, and you know, for us, we had these conversations early. Um, you know, our thought was this, you know, how do we want to start the conversation? You know, and for us, we really wanted our values, our morals uh, around this stuff to be the centerpiece of that conversation. And, uh, you know, kids are on devices much younger than in previous generations. and. One of the key places that kids can be getting their understanding and education around sex can be in the online space and in particular i suppose what we see is that young people can be uh, getting their education and understanding around sex from online pornography and um you know what we what we see and what we say is that if if pornography is the place where they're getting their first understanding of sex then what's happening is that pornography can be stepping in and becoming their sex educator. You know, I was uh, working in a school and a girl came and spoke to me and uh, she'd been, uh, about a week prior to, to us speaking in her school, she'd been heading home from school on her bus, jumped off her bus, another school went past and two boys sort of started yelling out uh, just uh, a, a term that she'd never heard before and it was a slang term for oral sex. And uh, they were yelling it out to another boy who was walking home and you know, she didn't know what this term meant. She'd never heard it before. She was quite young. Uh, she went home, went straight to her mum and said, you know, mum, what's mm -hmm. this mean? And her mum was perhaps taken aback but said to her daughter, you know, you shouldn't be asking me that. That's really rude. Don't ever say that again. You're never to say that term again. Now, of course, this girl still had this question and she went to uh, Google and typed her question into Google and, it, and of course, was quite quickly exposed to actually, uh, unfortunately for her, very graphic and violent uh, pornography. And you know, these stories that we hear, they're just such a constant reminder of how important it is for us to be engaging with our kids around this stuff. We find that questions uh, can be a really constant and a really powerful way of meeting our kids where they're at in this space. Yeah. There's a, um, a friend of mine who shared a story with me. It was in some respects a little bit similar to uh, the story this girl shared with Katie, except that uh, my friend had a son who was in year 10 uh, and he'd shared that on a Friday afternoon, uh, his son had come home from school. He was standing across the dinner table uh, or the kitchen bench, sorry. And uh, he said his son asked him this question and said, hey, dad, so there's some guys on the school bus this afternoon and they were talking about uh, oral sex. And he said, look, I, I understand how oral sex works. Uh, with a girl to a guy, but but how does it work with a guy to a girl? And that's a pretty confronting question to get across the kitchen table on a Friday afternoon, right? And so uh, before he even told me what happened next, I said, you are such an awesome dad. He said, well, look, I haven't even told you what happened. I said, I don't even need to know because if your son as a year 10 young guy standing across the kitchen bench asks you that question, Obviously, you've had a lot of conversations of this. He said, yeah, yeah, it's always been a no questions, so off limits. And uh, we've talked about a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, I just found myself so encouraged, so inspired as a father myself to say, you know, I want my son, when he gets to year 10, to feel like he could ask me that question. And the only way that's going to happen if there's consistent conversations uh, as the years go on. Uh, the reality is, 
if he didn't have the opportunity to ask that safe person that question, he was just a curious year 10 boy that was trying to figure something out in his head. And instead that could have been searched onto his laptop and been exposed to graphic uh, material that potentially wouldn't have given him the healthy context to consider uh, how to answer the curiosity that he had. And so you can understand why we believe conversation around this stuff is really important uh, for parents to be able to have with their kids. Mm. Uh, when we're, if we're talking about pornography tonight, which is certainly one of the uh, things we're going to be discussing, I'm just going to launch another quick poll here and get you to think about what would you believe would be the average age that young people today uh, would be first exposed. Oops, I've already jumped the gun. I pressed it too quick. <laughs> gone, gone too quickly there. Sorry. You're, you're already, everyone's jumping on now. You can see. Oh, everyone knows the answer. Everyone knows the answer. Well done there. Uh, so, yes, as you can see, uh, 11 <laughs> years of age uh, is the average age, and, and many of you uh, got that uh, right. And that's pretty young, right? Um, I don't think that's what we would want young people to be exposed to uh, at such a young age. Yeah, and now we're missing the number. <laughs> oh, let's go one more. Okay, there, yeah, 11. <laughs> yeah, and look, that can be really confronting. Um, and it certainly is confronting when we have conversations with parents who have found that they're 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, whatever, year old child uh, has been viewing pornography. It just seems so young. And it, um, it, it, we just find that parents can be really taken aback. Uh, we find, and it's really important for parents to understand that actually what we find is that there's not too many kids that are out there searching pornography purposely, uh, you know, seeking this stuff out. In fact, we find that there's three key ways that a child or a young person will first be exposed to pornography. The first way is that they tend to stumble across it while online. Now, this might be they're doing their homework, doing the right thing, and there's a pop-up. Or perhaps they're putting in a search term, you know, whatever it is that they're searching for, something like even searching for stuff for homework, and uh, they're exposed in that way. The second way that we find is that a sibling or a friend uh, turns and shows them or shares a link with them. One of the things that we are commonly finding with little children is that they can be coming home with little slips of paper in their pocket with a pornographic site written onto the piece of paper. And a mate at school just said, hey, take this home and look it up kind of thing. Um, the third way that we find is that they hear a sexual term, they don't know what it means. Like my beautiful little year eight uh, friend, uh, she just heard a term off the back of the bus uh, they don't know what it means and they actually don't have a place where they can ask those questions. Mm -hmm. And so they're very innocently putting this word that they don't have any context around into a, into a Google search and they can very quickly be exposed. Um, some research shows, uh, some, some recent research that showed that a young person is now able to access more sexual content in one night than one of their ancestors could in multiple lifetimes. And so the question is, of course, how is this affecting young people? Um, so I guess one of the things that we obviously need to consider around pornography is that there's certain things that pornography just will not teach children. And I think the concern is that if pornography does step in to be the key source of sex education, you can imagine the understanding of sex, the understanding of things like consent are going to be flawed or going to be kind of muddled up or a little bit confused and certainly things that pornography won't teach is consent it's not going to mm -hmm. teach love it's not going to teach respect it's not going to teach intimacy and any adult that's in a positive healthy uh, sexual relationship would have an awareness that those four things are pretty crucial uh, in any sexual relationship and the problem becomes if they're not learning that stuff there can be some real confusion i remember hearing a podcast of a um uh an interview that was done with a porn producer and this interviewer was asking this porn producer who'd been in the pornography industry for well over 20 years uh and he asked him this question he said uh in over 20 years of producing pornography what have you seen change between kind of or, or over those years and the, and the porn producer had a really interesting response. He said this, he said, well, 20 years ago, I was filming people making love. He said, but today I film people making hate. And the reality is that unfortunately for so many young people, their exposure to pornography is filled with violence or aggression. 
Uh, a study in 2014 found the most common uh, or, or of the most watched films in that year uh, out of 264 scenes within those films that they, uh, that they okay. went through, pornographic films, sorry. Um, they found that 84% of the scenes actually showed physical, verbal, uh, sexual violence towards women by men. Uh, but the craziest thing about the research is it found that 95% of the responses of those women was either pleasure or no response at all. So you imagine a child, a preteen child, seeing that version of sex and believing that that must be what sex is or that's what normal people would like a normal situation would would happen yeah it's going to cause some real confusion uh, for them yeah we find that uh, if parents haven't educated their kids about sex and and what it's all about and then their child is exposed to pornography we find that parents are, are having to back pedal uh and you know some of the things that we very often hear from parents in the conversation they, they realize that their child has been exposed or they kind of stumble across their child looking at pornography uh, some of the things that they're saying to their children that's not what sex is about it's not like what you've seen it's not like what you've been watching uh, and you know the the heartbreaking thing is is that these parents are, are then having to re-educate their child and uh, their child has been educated by pornography. This is what sex is about. And then parents are having to step in and, and try and undo some of that, uh, some of that education, some of that damage, I suppose. Uh, when we first started doing this work, we were attempting to teach parents how to protect their child from seeing porn during their childhood years. And um, sorry, I've just lost my notes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay. um, the thing that, uh, sorry, I've just totally lost. Don't leave that. <laughs> These days, uh, we recognise that research indicates that almost all kids will see porn. Our job as parents then becomes to educate our kids about sex from our perspectives, you know, from our belief systems, whatever that is for you. If you don't teach them about sex, then research indicates that pornography most certainly will. So obviously this topic of consent is really important uh, for every young person to have an awareness and an understanding uh, around. And obviously pornography influencing that can certainly cause some confusion. And the definition of sexual consent uh, is the free, uh, enthusiastic and active agreement uh, in, uh, to engage in sexual activity. Mm. Uh, and that includes everything from kissing and touching uh, to actually sex itself. Now, sometimes we hear that with, okay, yep, let's, let's talk about consent then when they're at an age that they might be considering having sex. But the problem is, is that that often is, is sometimes we would see too late. We think that this should be starting very early and very young. Um, and it doesn't need to be about sex in the early stages. It can be about getting consent to hold a friend's hand. Can I hold your hand? Can I give you a hug? Uh, it, it's important to learn consent in the online space. Can I take your picture? Can I post your picture? Uh, simple questions like this are just communicating that there's a difference between is this okay or is this not? Is this wanted or unwanted? Yeah, totally. <laughs> so the experience of being pressured or coerced uh, into sexual experiences for young people today, it, it's actually quite prevalent. There was a 2018 Australian Secondary Sexual Health Survey uh, that was uh, done for year 10, 11, 12 students in Catholic, independent and public schools all around Australia uh, and found that 30% uh, of sexually active teens uh, had experienced unwanted sex. Uh, another 2018 uh, Australian longitudinal study of 16 to 17 year olds found that half of girls and one third of boys had reported uh, experiencing unwanted sex. Uh, and even uh, the uh, eSafety Commissioner's uh, survey in 2019 found that one in four teens uh, had been pressured uh, or coerced to send a nude image of themselves. So conversation around consent you can see is very, very important. You will notice that Dave used this language, um, unwanted sex. And, you know, we started seeing that language popping up in the research papers probably about nine years ago. And uh, if I'm honest, first it really annoyed me because it, it felt it was being used, unwanted sex was being used in, in place of terms such as 
rape, sexual assault. And to me, it just felt like a downgrading terminology, such a serious crime, such a devastating experience, of course, for a victim. Uh, but actually what the researchers were finding was that particularly for a young person and particularly for a young person who had experienced rape in the context of a dating relationship, they were finding that actually it was difficult, if not impossible for that young person to A, acknowledge their experience and B, give voice to that. It was difficult, if not impossible for that young person to say, my boyfriend raped me, my girlfriend raped me. And so this terminology actually has become really important and uh, we see it used across the board, rape counsellors, youth workers. And we really encourage parents to use this language as well. And uh, just helping young people, we find that um, one of the common things that I hear from a young person who has experienced sexual assault, uh, well, of course my boyfriend pressures me to have sex. Of course my girlfriend pressures me to have sex. It's a normal relationship. Mm. And we find that there can be a real breakdown in the understanding of what is sexual assault, what is rape, what is acceptable in relationship. And so this language we find uh, can be really helpful in just exploring these topics uh, in a way. And when we're talking about consent, of course it is. And, you know, when I, when I talk to uh, young people, you know, we say if, if someone's trying to pressure you to date or pressure you to go to a party with them or pressure to kiss or pressure to hold hands even and, and younger younger children you know it's really important to explore the digital space as well then that's a real sign of dishealth and so exploring uh, consent across the board uh, and, and again from quite a young age can be a really important thing in educating our kids around these topics. Yeah so we, we shared obviously that we're going to uh, give a little bit of the neuroscience around uh, the impact of pornography is having on young people uh, today and uh, Dr Donald Hilton a, a very famous uh, doctor in the US regardless actually one of the top doctors in America right now has has said that pornography is a biologically addictive medium that alters the brain reward and motivation systems in a negative way. Uh, in essence, he suggests that pornography seems to have an effect on the brain that's quite similar to the effect the drugs have on the brain. One of the things that drugs, alcohol, most addictive substances cause to happen in the brain is a large production of dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter that's associated with reward. It's what gives us motivation to, to seek things out that we believe would give us pleasure. Uh, the problem is you can hijack the dopamine producing part of the brain. And you know, our government has put laws and restrictions around alcohol because of an understanding of the effect that can have on the teenage brain. Yet in many regards, a device in a young person's hands with no restrictions and no uh, kind of controls can allow a young person to sit there for hours and hours and hours consuming endless amounts of pornography, having massive amounts of dopamine produced in their brain, causing really an overload of this, which is problematic for teenagers because what it tends to cause in the future is that as they get into their late teens, their early 20s, that huge amount of dopamine from watching pornography can affect their ability to connect in real relationships. Uh, you know, Norman Doidge, who wrote a book called The Brain That Changes Itself, he said when a person is continuously strengthening the brain maps linking sexual excitement to porn, those maps in the brain, those pathways can enlarge and then what they do is they crowd out maps linking sexual excitement to a real person or real sex. So all of a sudden the reality doesn't compare to the fantasy, that all of a sudden people don't compare to pixels. And this is really damaging for young people. It's something that when young people hear the science around, there is real concern. Hey, I don't want that to happen to me. Uh, and so obviously there's an awareness then, okay, maybe you need to change some behavior. Thankfully the brain is moldable and changeable and uh, things can happen in that space, but awareness is certainly a big part that teenagers and young people need to be aware of and we see a lot of link between watching pornography and then this new modern day uh, sexual exploration uh, of sexting. Yeah uh, so we've got the definition uh, that we use there on the screen I'll let you read that for yourself but this is a really challenging topic and of all the topics that we discuss uh, sexting is in many ways perhaps the most challenging we see the biggest generational gap in this space you know in every seminar that we run uh, we ask young people, 
this question, you know, how many of you on being given a mobile phone or a handheld device, how many of you had your parent or your carer sit down with you and say, sweetheart, uh, we just want to talk to you about something. We're giving you this phone. But at some point, somebody might ask you to send a nude image or someone might uh, send you a nude image of themselves. If that happens, this is what we want you to do. This is who we want you to talk to. And you know, it's, it's amazing because what we find is that in a room of say 100 students, there might be five, sometimes maybe 10 students who will put their hand up. Yep, mom, dad, whoever has had that conversation with me. But largely what we find is that the experience of young people is that they've been completely left alone on this topic. Uh, and we find, you know, we kind of often find this perception that uh, sexting is just kind of a somewhere out there kind of topic. But actually we find within pop culture, within youth culture, it's incredibly prevalent. And I'm just going to put some examples up here on the screen. Yeah, and it's really interesting because we, we have seen this become so accepted within pop culture, so normalised that if you listen to the radio and you hear the top 40 songs, you'll often hear references uh, to sexting within those songs. Um, I know I saw uh, that even in America today, they have a, um, well, not today, but in general, they have a national send a nude day. <laughs> like if that isn't showing how far this has kind of gone, you can imagine a young person who's seeing celebrities that are, are kind of bragging about this, songs that are singing about this, people that are becoming famous for this, and then they're going, but I'm being told not to do this. Why wouldn't I when everyone else seems to be doing it? Uh, and so there can be this confusion. And one of the concerns we particularly have about sexting is the reduction of just being body, um, a bunch of parts and focusing on parts and not the humanity of the person. Um, so really what's important to understand around sexting uh, is that uh, a couple of quick things that research is telling us. This is an interesting study done by the eSafety Commissioner found nine out of 10 teens thought the second uh, sexting uh, happened amongst their pe uh, peers. However, of those students, and look, the reality is the numbers I believe in other research would show it's much higher than this 5% that this study found. but those students themselves said, hey, nine out of 10 people are sending nudes. But then when asked themselves, 5% said they actually had done that. So there's often a disconnect between reality and maybe what uh, others are saying. Yeah, but there can be just this thinking that everybody's doing it. And if there's not conversation in the home, what we find is that uh, if a young person hasn't talked through these topics, if they're thinking everyone does this, then sooner or later, we find that young people might possibly fall into the trap of engaging in this stuff. And so that's where conversation is so critical. Te te teens, sorry, <laughs> were three times more likely to have been asked for a nude than sending one. Uh, and for those that were asked, over half of the requests came from someone that they didn't know. And so, of course, this is very concerning. Mm -hmm. And again, this can be very challenging very confronting. We often find particularly younger teens in this situation, they feel like they've done something wrong. Of course, they haven't, uh, but we often find they're not eating, they're not sleeping, uh, struggling with depression, anxiety, those kinds of things. We have to meet our, our children in this space. We mustn't leave them alone to navigate these, this, these topics. Yeah. Wanted to just, uh, this is a really important term for... Um, I think everyone to understand image-based abuse. Did you want to just quickly? You can do it. Uh, you go. You go. <laughs> uh, so it's defined as the uh, taking, uh, sharing, or threatening to share uh, nude or sexual images of a person without their consent. Now this has replaced the, the. You would have seen cases in the news about revenge porn, mm -hmm. uh, where people were being prosecuted because someone had. Uh, had an image sent in a relationship and then they had distributed that uh, and it was called revenge porn. Yeah. Uh, well, this is the term that's being used in courts and around the country now, image-based abuse. Uh, we believe it's important for every young person uh, to be aware of. RMIT University uh, did a study in 2019, found that one in three, these were 16 to 49-year-olds, had experienced image-based abuse. Uh, and one in six had themselves said, yes, I have taken, I have shared, or I have threatened to share a nude image of someone. 
So this is quite prevalent uh, within Australia today. Yeah, and of course the challenge with the term revenge porn is it implies that the victim has done something, you know, that, that someone's seeking revenge on them for, which of course is, is you know, never the case. It's really important for us to not uh, be victim blaming. We, we do commonly see that when it comes particularly to uh, sexting. I was working in a school and, and really one of the key terms there is always we, we talk about um, taking a photo, sharing a photo or threatening and threatening is a new as a new addition to this year to that terminology. Uh, I was working in a school and a girl came and spoke to me. She had been involved with a guy. Uh, they had broken up a year prior to our conversation and uh, just recently he had started reaching out to her friends and sharing kind of um, mistruths and rumours about her. These were really confronting to her and she was quite taken aback by the things that he was saying. She'd blocked him on all forms of social media. She made the decision to reach out to him. She unblocked him on one particular platform and messaged him, you know, what's going on? Why are you saying these things about me? He never wrote anything back to her that was helpful. He never explained himself. Instead, he just one by one started sending uh, these nude images that she had once sent to him back to her. And, uh, you know, most certainly this girl was at risk and she was a victim of image-based abuse. And, uh, you know, this girl, she didn't feel like she could talk to her parents about this. And, uh, you know, we were able to get her in contact with the e-safety commissioner and she was able to get the help that she needed. But it's so important for us to be having these conversations with our kids about these topics. Um, yeah, and so if you're, that has happened to your child or in the middle of a situation like that, the e-safety commissioner is the best place to go to get support around that. Uh, they've got great support for parents, for children, uh, that will really help in that space. Yeah. Um, so we are going to uh, kind of wrap this up. We're going to uh, leave you with this one last poll. As you can see, we're a bit of fan of the polls and the interaction. <laughs> So the question is, like lots of stuff we've talked about, but how committed are you to help your child make great choices around sex and relationships? Um, because obviously we see it from our perspective, this is important. These are things that we see every day uh, in schools and working with young people that, you know, kids and, and, and parents, if they can kind of get on the same page, we can see kids making really great uh, choices. And uh, as you can see in our poll, the vast majority of you fully committed and the rest somewhat committed. Hey, no one's not really committed at all. So that's fantastic. <laughs> um, but uh, look, we're really hoping that this has been helpful and it's just maybe opened up uh, some awareness and we'll create some further conversation. Uh, we're going to head back to Jessica. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, guys. That was fantastic. It was just so fascinating to learn. And as a parent myself, I am heading home after this to start having those um, important conversations with my kids. My um, daughter, Matilda, she is just about to turn 11, so she's right at that age. Um, so thank you so much for that. Uh, so now I'm going to show you how Family Zone can complement uh, what we just learnt from Dave and Katie. And while Family Zone will never replace the power of communication in your household, we can offer you some tools that will make our life as digital parents a little bit easier. So um, to begin with, I think I should better um, introduce myself a little bit better. As I said, my name is Jessica and I've been with Family Zone since 2017. Before I came to Family Zone, um, I was working for the Western Australia Police in the sex crime division. I was in the um, cyber area of the child exploitation unit um, and I was just really horrified by the sheer quantity of cases that was flooding my desk. Um, everything from grooming, uh, blackmail, I had so many cases of image-based abuse, the one that Dave and Katie just um, described, um, that yeah, I just couldn't believe how busy it was. And what that really made me feel was really scared for myself and my family. <laughs> like Matilda and Harper were quite little at that time, but they were already using devices. And I knew that myself, just like a lot of parents out there, 
really didn't have um, a cyber safety home. I didn't have any parental controls in place um, and nothing in place to protect my kids. So that's when I started researching um, how I could protect my kids and I came across Family Zone. And I was so impressed with how what a pr proactive tool it is to put things in place to really protect children um, online. Um, and I was so impressed that I um, jumped ship and have been working for Family Zone and helping parents like yourself um, ever since. So I guess um, we should really start with a good uh, definition. Oh, no, too far, sorry. I got ahead of myself. So before I get too far into it, I just wanted to show you some family zone statistics, which really backs up what Dave and Katie are saying. So it's really what we're seeing here at Family Zone as well. Um, so what you're looking at on the screen is um, some anonymous data that Family Zone collected of everyday usage patterns of these aged children. So on the left, we've got children 9 to 12, and on the right, a little bit older kids, 13 to 15. And this is what they've been blocked. This is what Family Zone has blocked them from seeing. So you can see here, you know, 19% 9 to 12 year olds were blocked from seeing pornography. So that just confirms exactly what Dave and Katie um, are seeing at their end as well. So um, thankfully all these families had family zone in place. So those these kids didn't um, see anything inappropriate, but it just really demonstrates how easily um, and often these kids are stumbling along um, inappropriate adult content. Um, so what is Family Zone? Uh, for those of you that are really new to Family Zone, we are a parental control, but we're also a cyber safety solution. So what that means is we're really interested in keeping kids safe online no matter what device they're using and what source of internet they're using. Um, we can offer you technology as a tool to you know, make parenting a little bit easier, but we also form these really good relationships with cyber experts like Dave and Katie from your choices um, because it's not just about technology it's about um, educating parents and children and having those really important conversations at home but some of the benefits that family zone can offer you um, in making the journey a little bit easier for us we can filter the internet for you, for your children um, to block all that inappropriate adult content. We can help you manage their social media, they manage their gaming, and bundle it all up in easy to read reports so you know exactly what they're doing online and when. Yeah. So probably one of um, the most popular benefits of Family Zone, which really ties in with what we were talking about tonight, is how we manage internet content for your children. So we filter the internet on um, an age um, and an age limit. So what that means is my daughter Matilda, for example, she's 10, um, so she can see certain parts of the internet. Whereas my best friend's son is 17 and he can see a whole lot more of the internet. But, you know, we are filtering the internet to remove that adult content so, um, you know, your kids aren't seeing anything inappropriate. Because as we saw from the previous slides where we showed the usage patterns of children, they really are stumbling across adult content at a very young age. And while I don't think for a second that your nine-year-old is actively seeking out pornography, um, it just shows that they can easily stumble across it. You can literally type anything into the internet these days and there will be adult content amongst the results. Um, so while the internet has lots of wonderful qualities and lots of benefits for our children, it is rife with adult content. So how do we allow our children to get and experience those benefits without putting them at risk? Well, that's where Family Zone can come into it. Um, but again, you still need to make sure you're having those conversations and educating yourself by people like Dave and Katie, because while your home might be a cyber safe home with Family Zone in place, next door, the kids might not have it next door and your kids are going there. So they're still at risk of seeing inappropriate content. Um, so you still need to be having those tricky conversations, yeah? 
Um, so the other um, really good benefit of Family Zone that's another massive challenge for um, us digital parents <laughs> is how we manage our kids' screen time. Uh, it's just so hard these days, isn't it? They spend so much time online at school and then they get home and they want to spend more time online. Um, and, you know, we're often working parents and very busy ourselves. So how do we manage that? To, so that the kids can get the most out of the internet, but it's not taking over their life. We still want them, you know, playing sport, going on play dates, and, you know, getting decent sleep. Um, so with Family Zone, you can manage your kids' screen time with our use of calendars and routines. Um, as you can see from the screen, you can set some time periods for when you think it's okay for your kids to use the internet for fun and games. You can also set them some study time so that they can get in and get their homework done without being distracted by those games and apps. And then you can also set them a bedtime where the internet just gets switched off and they get a good night's sleep without being interrupted by all those pings and notifications. Um, and as, as with everything in Family Zone, it's fully customizable um, and really easy to make changes, yeah? So probably the last benefit that I wanna go through quickly with you tonight before we head on to some questions is how we manage social media. So with Family Zone, you will be able to see what apps your children have on their devices. And this is just such a fantastic tool because it really um, allows parents to be involved in what their children are doing online. As you can see from the screen, you can see what apps your kids have. You can go in and read what the cyber experts think about that app. And then you as a parent can make an informed decision as to whether that app is appropriate for your child or not. Um, it's just so important to make sure you're involved in what your kids are doing online. Um, because like I remember I had a case when I was working at the police where I was working uh, with a young girl who had got herself into some serious strife on Instagram. She'd been groomed terribly um, and had made the mistake of exchanging some photos um, and it was just a terrible case that ended up on my desk. Um, and I remember one of the things that her mum said to me that's really stuck with me all these years later. Um, she says to me, Jess, I didn't even know she was on Instagram. So that is just horrifying because, you know, you want your children to be able to come to you when they get into trouble on these platforms, yeah? It's so important, you know, I don't expect you to be an expert on every app and every game, but it's so important just to be across on what they're doing. Um, but it also, not only does it keep them safe, but it also communicates to your children that you value what they're doing. Um, and, you know, my kids just love it when I try and try and play their games with them. My son um, loves when I try to play Fortnite. I am terrible at that game. I find it very overwhelming. The, you know, the buttons are confusing and everyone's yelling at me and I really hate it. But my kids love it. They get the biggest kick at how terrible I'm at, at it and they are so much better at it than I am. But it shows them that... You know, they can come to me if they have any trouble on that platform um, and really opens up that communication and I'm right across what they're doing online. Um, so really, that is what all I wanted to show you in terms of um, how Family Zone can assist you in all of this. It really is about communication within the household, but Family Zone is just a super handy tool that you can use um, to make that digital journey a little bit easier. So if you guys um, want to get Family Zone at your home, uh, we can give you a discount tonight using your, your choices discount. Uh, we we will make this available for you after the webinar. So I will email out the um, recording of the webinar and make sure I include this link as well so that you can get that discount. Um, so that's really it for tonight. If you uh, do need some help with Family Zone, we have lots of different resources for you. We have a fantastic YouTube channel um, at Family Zone Cyber Safety. So if you head to the YouTube channel, lots of webinars um, are placed on, on there. Uh, and we have an events calendar as well with lots of upcoming webinars. 
Uh, but if you just need some help at support, you can definitely shoot them an email at support at familyzone.com, um, particularly if we don't get to your question tonight. Um, but I am really hoping that um, Dave and Katie have time for a few questions tonight. Do you think that that would be all right, Dave and Katie? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I can see that um, a few questions have come through already. Uh, one of the questions that came through earlier is I've had to try, I've tried to have these conversations with my children, but the last thing she wants to do is talk about this with my mum. Ew. <laughs> Any suggestions there, guys? Uh, look, I think I think this can be a common experience. Oh, I don't want to. This is awkward. This is this is really tough. I think one of the things that sometimes is helpful in for conversations is to try and avoid it being personal. So, for instance, a topic like sexting, it's probably not going to go great if you ask her about the sending or receiving of nudes on her own device. But yeah. what she probably would be more likely to feel comfortable talking about is maybe what her friends are doing or what she's overheard other people doing at school. Um, do, do, uh, do boys ask girls for photos? Uh, has there been people that have had sex that you know of? Like conversations about other people? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then there sometimes can be, okay, well, is this something... Uh, like, what would you do in that situation? Um, I think the other thing as well is that it. Uh, I often hear that, that, oh, like, don't want to talk about it, but then we'll go and share the information they got to their friends and say, oh, my mum told me this. Yeah. And so uh, yeah. personally, I think sometimes the avoid saying no, 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 don't want to, but they really do. They're just, it's kind of the... the the general response. That's a great tip, like put it into third person. So girls, you know, and boys, not you specifically. Um, so yeah. another question we had is how early should we start the conversation with our children? That's a great question. Yeah, it's a good question. And um, I think we always recommend preventative conversation. So uh, have the conversation before you think they're ready. And, uh, you know, for us, we wanted to, we wanted to be that first person. And when it comes to sex and it comes to pornography, we wanted to be the people who are educating our children. And so we made sure we started those conversations before our kids went to school. And, you know, we just found that kids are so receptive to those conversations when they're little. Sex hasn't been sexualized, if you like, uh, at that young age. And, uh, you know, we just found our kids were, it wasn't awkward. They weren't embarrassed. Uh, I remember one of our kids were reading a certain book and uh, he was like, can we go back to that last page? I like that page, you know. And there's no embarrassment around it. And it gives us this opportunity to fully educate our kids uh, without them sort of squirming and, you know, whatever. Mm. And so, yeah, we always suggest. Early quite young when it comes to pornography you can talk to your kids about pornography at a young age and it's not exposing them to inappropriate content it's just kind of saying you know there's this thing out there and you need to be aware of it and this is how it makes you feel this is what it does to your brain and if you ever see that we want you to come and talk to us about that you don't need to feel embarrassed or ashamed about trouble. that yeah. yeah but this is what you do as opposed to leaving kids to figure it out on their own and then talking to them you yeah, after this. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Which actually goes, well, I think there's another question about um, uh, uh, someone who has a five and a seven year old. Yeah, um, that's what I was about to say. What about um, kids who have already been exposed to inappropriate yeah. sexual um, information? How do you yeah. sort of uh, fi fix that? <laughs> yeah, look, I think um, it's a great question. And there's, there's actually a lot of tools. There's a book we recommend, and I'm not sure if perhaps this person who asked this question is aware of this book. It's called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. Yeah. And the great thing about books is that it just allows you to re-educate uh, that child. And it is so, so unfortunate and horrible that this has happened uh, to these two children. 
but you do have the opportunity to re-educate them. You know, two of the, or three of the things that we really encourage parents when they're talking to little children about sex or porn is to always include consent in that conversation. So even when we were talking to our kids when they were little about sex, we say, you know, it's important that both people uh, want to engage in that. The other thing is pleasure. And, you know, sex is supposed to feel good. And a lot of people don't like that. They want to just talk about sex from a biological perspective. But our belief is that it should always be presented, even from little little children, that people have sex because it feels good. Yeah. And uh, that becomes really important uh, if a child is exposed to pornography. or And for these children, I think that that's, they're really important factors to bring into your conversations that, you know, sex is supposed to be pleasurable and sex is supposed to be consensual, both parties wanting to engage in that. What's the other thing we always talk about? Can't remember, sorry. <laughs> um, but, so, yeah. So just quickly moving on to maybe one more. Um, what should a parent do if a child has been sent a picture or been asked to send a picture? Yeah, that's a really, uh, again, a great question, mm -hmm. a very common uh, question. Look, um, you know, if someone asks for a picture um, and someone responds with no, I don't want to, or sends some kind of response saying that they don't want to, and then uh, another request is made, uh, that second request is actually legally that's all that's needed to, to take further action if, if that parent would, uh, wants to go down that road. Um, it's sexual harassment, essentially. Like, we know in the workplace people lose their jobs over that. And for some reason, when it's kids, we kind of go, oh, they're just kind of kids. And uh, But really, uh, it, it's very important to help your child understand what's appropriate and what's not. And sometimes it might not necessarily be going to the police about it, but it's helping them understand, hey, this, this actually, this person isn't doing the right thing by you. Did you want them to send you that? Well, if not, that's not okay. And what would be helpful? Do you yeah. want to jump in there? Yeah, look, if, you want to? <laughs> yeah if we're talking about a child, as in uh, in most states under 16 and in some 17, if a child's been, if, if a child has sent an image of themselves or, or requested one time, then already there's some problems there uh, because of the age of consent. And so, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to... Yeah, yeah, no, it was just that they said if they've been asked... Um, yeah, or to send a picture it depends right. who like if it's a child and a child sent as well yeah yeah so yeah yeah so it definitely is. i would suggest um familiarize yourself with the laws in the state that you live in um because they do differ slightly from state to state uh, but they are pretty easy to find and pretty easy to digest um, and i would be having those serious legal conversations with your children because quite often they don't realize that um even you know having a photo of themselves um it it, it's inappropriate and it's against the law as well, yeah? Um, and they need to be made aware of that and then, you know, having that deeper conversation around the why, why is that happening? All right, guys, well, I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. This has been a long one. Um, there's a few questions that we haven't got to, but hopefully we'll be able to get to those after the session. Um, thank you so much for your participation, everyone. There's been some really fantastic questions coming through in this last session. Um, but I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank you, Dave and Katie, for coming on tonight. It's been such a fabulous session. I've learned so much and I really can't wait to get home and start having those conversations with my children because I definitely don't want them Googling um, looking for those answers. So thank you so much for your time and I hope that we can do this again. Hey, this has been real fun. Yeah, yeah great. Thanks, thank you. Jess. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.